Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is about when compiler magic goes wrong. And as a part of this, we'll also kind of discuss why ignoring uh, the history of uh, software can be a real detriment to you understanding a problem. Firstly, um, as a background, this is about JavaScript and TypeScript, which is targeted all too often, but this is a vendor specific extension for a specific product. It's not a general language feature or proposal. And so again, this is not a general criticism of the language. So just keep that in mind when you're listening to this. I will talk about some of the issues of the culture around JavaScript and TypeScript, but at, in this case, this has nothing to do with, with the fundamental languages themselves. So what started this was this notion of, of this use strict string. And it literally is a string that you put at the top of a file or the top of a function. And what it does is it serves as a compiler directive. Some people call these pragmas in C++. C Sharp also has pragmas. And what it is is it's a way of telling the compiler, hey, treat this code differently in some way. And in the case of JavaScript, was disallow a lot of these features, warn for all these types of things, produce errors, um, and to make things more strict, to not be as loosey-goosey, to cause things that were unsafe and unsecure, to, you know, basically that were issues in older versions of JavaScript and the engines that ran them, you know, don't allow these things to happen anymore. And the reason they added it as a string like that is that that older versions of the runtime would happily pass those things over. They'd parse, but they'd be ignored. And so that was a nice way of adding this com this notion of a compiler directive, but um, maintaining backwards compatibility and not having to add new syntax in. So React then kind of took this idea and kind of um, used it for their um, React server component type of thing. They have these use client use server directives, and that affects how code is bundled, where it's run versus um, what parts are run where. There's a lot of complex things I don't quite understand and get the depths of. But again, it was the same type of thing, but it was also completely tied to React and had nothing to do with the core language at all, and was really about their compilers that they are developing that did this. And some people are starting to question if the React was starting to use compiler magic too much in terms of not just using these kinds of directives, but also doing things like auto memoization and all those other types of stuff. And those question marks are still up there till, to this day. What really kind of added onto this is that Vercel just announced a, kind of this workflow product. And what they've done is they've used directives, they use these use workflow, use step directives to kind of enable these long-term durable workflows from what it would ordinarily be just fairly straightforward asynchronous functions. And the question really came up is like, well, okay, now are you pushing things too far? And I think to really answer this question, it's good to look at some background on how you would extend languages. The first really kind of interesting extension mechanism that kind of gained mainstream support was attributes in C sharp. And what this was is that this is just a way of, in a structured manner, adding additional metadata to a class or function. And that meant that uh, the compiler or other libraries could reflect on that uh, those attributes and treat the code in a different way, depending on what attributes were there or weren't there. And this is probably best explained with an example. Here's an example, C-sharp. I have a property here, but the idea behind this is that this is just for convenience. This is actually derived from the other properties that might exist in this class. And so if I was serializing it, it makes no sense to add this as a key and value to that JSON. And so this attribute tells the JSON serialization code, ignore this property when you're serializing. And this is a really good way of doing things because you don't have to do things by configuration or convention. You can just basically explicitly say, hey, don't do this. And then if you aren't JSON, a serializer, you can look at this and just not care. You don't, this doesn't change anything. You still just use this as a, as a dry property. So very useful. Attributes are used quite a bit in C Sharp. A lot of them, there's a lot of stuff that's used underneath the hood to help the compiler do certain types of things, but it's fairly straightforward. And of course, the way you define attributes is, is that attributes are C Sharp classes, essentially. Now, this is supported in a lot of, a lot of other languages now as well. Um, modern C Sharp, excuse me, modern C++ supports it. Java has annotations, same type of thing. Rust has them. In JavaScript, this is even a feature. They call them decorators. It's still in the proposed feature and it's stage three, but it's very similar to how attributes work in C Sharp. Another um, more powerful, but potentially 
dangerous, if you would say, um, extensibility notion is macros and domain specific languages. Um, since I've done a lot of view on, videos on Racket, I know a lot about this because Racket is really the language that does macros as best as any other language out there. Um, it's really a core feature to the language and it's an environment that really supports the notion of developing domain specific languages, which are literally, you know, entire code bases that are, you know, basically, you know, ultimately supported by <laughs> racket macros. In this case, what comes up with macros and DSLs, um, and there's some support for them in other languages, it's not nearly as often. There's like Rust is starting to develop some support for it, but in other cases, there's not nearly as much. Um, but this is another thing where there's been a lot of exploring of how to do this and extend things. And crossing the threshold from useful to difficult here um, happens a lot sooner than expected, which is why this isn't adopted as much. One, it is actually hard to understand how to write macros. And two, the problem is, is that if you have that understanding of how to do macros well, you may be a skilled enough programmer that you might have a hard time realizing how an average programmer actually would use this. And it might be, as some people say, too clever for your its own good. And it's really hard for someone to develop macros or DSLs that makes sense for the average user that don't just become a real issue in terms of long-term maintainability or who can actually write using those macros and DSLs. And what this comes down to is like, it works until it doesn't. So, and when it doesn't is when ultimately somebody has to debug things when they didn't, when they didn't what, to figure out why something is not going well or isn't working. And the more magic that occurs, the worse that debugging experience gets. And also that the usability plummets rapidly. The window of when things make sense and it works starts to close. And when you get past that, it becomes like, oh my gosh, it just becomes impossible. So it's almost like you have to do things exactly right or just all completely falls apart. And again, for your average developer, that raises the bar. Sometimes it raises the bar too high in terms of being able to actually make some a code base work with it. So in the case of Vercel, this workflow magic, I would say, is that the, the, current, the concern is that, that these extensions, they really do have a massive semantic impact to what the code actually is doing versus what it looks like. And you know that all that's happening behind the scenes, there's not a lot of insight into it. And this, it, you know, basically there's, the, the thing about it is, is this magic is too magic. And I think that's probably correct in this case. There's so much that they're doing there that if you take a look at the experience for debugging these things, and also I have some other questions, but just from that, from the UX experience, I can see this going off the rails very rapidly, very quickly. The other thing about this is that the history of workflow has a long and storied and checkered past. I'm familiar with it because I did a lot of work on the UML 2.0 standard. And one of the big parts of the UML 2.0 standard was things like activity diagrams and state diagrams. And activity diagrams, there's a big interest in using those for workflow engines. You know, so you could have this high level representation of how tasks tied together and you can use flowcharts and execute flowcharts and do all this type of stuff to, you know, engineer these long term workflows. The thing about it is, is that the problem looks pretty complex on the outside, um, the more you think about it. And the more you think about it, the even worse it gets in terms of what's going on. And there's all sorts of stuff that happens. There's things about how you deal with high object hydration. How do you deal with code and workflow versioning? There's all these things around dead task detection, detection. How do you know when a task should be retried? Because when it tried to do something, it threw an exception that was transient versus it can't do its job because the circumstances have changed so much that it can't complete and keeps throwing exceptions. So reclamation is, and, and, you know, is one thing, you know, basically how you can, you know, just, it just goes on and on and on. It gets really complicated. Look at this. It's one of those things where if you took a look at the Vercel example, they basically have one of the steps where the step says, oh, sleep for seven days and then send an email. Well, what if you change that workflow and said, oh, no, the call is get a value that says how long you send the email to after a new user signed up. And so the API calls now, and now I'll wait, send email, user, and the period, and the, uh, how long they want to wait. And the reason they did that is, is that the marketing guys came along and said, hey, we want to do some A-B testing to see, you know, the, the what's the optimal window for re-engaging with our users in terms of a hello email. So we want some users to do it for five days. And we want some users to do it for 10 days, right? Very reasonable. 
Okay, so you do this, all right, bam. How do you add that new thing into the environment, right? Well, that seems fairly straightforward, but it's not. And the reason being is, is that, well, you can't just change everything about that API because you have all this old code that has to use that old API, right? So you have to version that code. And so they have these old workflows that are running for seven days, along with these new workflows that are running, okay? Well, what if one of the old workflows um, has a problem with it, right? Well, someone goes off and looks at the source. If they look at the last one and didn't notice this older version, they get completely confused because they're debugging a source that isn't actually being used by these old workflows. And the thing about it is, is that when you think about it, it's like, oh, well, this does seven days, but this is part of a 60-day workflow that's over six months. That leads to a massive problem of changing the system actually can take a very, very long time because you have to wait for all these old workflows to flush themselves out. Or you have to come up with a way to migrate them. And if you think about that, it's like, oh. And so that's what a lot of these workflows try to do is they try to rehydrate themselves in this new environment and try to pl plunder along. And what it ended up doing is you had to make so, everything so explicit that it just made no sense. The, the workflows became too complicated. And so this gets really hard, really fast. And it's not as obvious as you would think until you see it and then you're like, oh, okay, wow. All right, this actually is really hard. So, but there's such a demand for this that there's been a lot, there are players in the space and there's a lot of big um, software solutions that support this. Right now, the biggest players in the space are IBM and Oracle. And the broad consensus about these business orchestration systems or the, these workflow engines is that they're legacy systems that are massively expensive to maintain and even harder to change. And would most businesses would very much like to get rid of them, would not be dependent on them at all. And because they are one of those things where there's a cruel irony that for all the promise of flexibility that these systems pretended to have, it was one of those things where the reality of making any changes to them whatsoever is so expensive and so difficult that no one actually ever does it. They don't dare, they don't touch them. And I'll also want to bring up the history that Microsoft has around here because I also think it's important to note. Um, Microsoft for a long time had a product called BizTalk Server, and this still is being used. It's going to go out of support in 2028. Um, and as part of the .NET development, um, there was a major project to add what was called the Windows Workflow Foundation Library. And this was kind of add modern workforce support to .NET Framework, um, be able to modernize BizTalk Server, and you know again, to provide more developers with this ability to do these long-standing workflows. And it gained uh, no traction in the long run, despite a large amount of investment. There's a significant amount of code that was developed and a significant amount of support put into it. And it all kind of just fizzled out because, again, the promised flexibility that it had actually never panned out. And you just ended up being completely tied to this very frozen, very complicated system. So here's the thing. Innovation is certainly possible. I don't want to try to just put to the side. But if you're going off and saying, hey, you don't give me any idea about how you're avoiding a lot of these mistakes that were made before by very large players, then people are going to be very skeptical. And in this domain, the skepticism is very much earned and warranted because of how many people have invested in these systems only to get burned very badly. So what this kind of comes down to is there's a cost in hiding complexity from developers. You need to do some of it. Um, because if you don't do that, then you end up having everything, everybody writes in assembly and that just doesn't really help. But the more a tra tool transforms its source into something completely different, the more difficult that source becomes to develop and debug. And we've gotten to a certain level of complexity in terms of we're used to taking source languages that ultimately turn into assembly. That debug process for most languages is, is quite good, quite solid. We have to understand how to do this. When it talks to macros and DSLs, and these other types of languages, we're not quite there yet. And it's also why, again, things like UML and business process modeling notation and all these things didn't succeed well in the workflow space and in other spaces is because this higher level of abstraction, which was literally transforming this diagram into a running bit of software, again, the debugging process and maintenance process became too difficult to do. Um, it became too you know, inflexible.
the thing about this though is, is that what's interesting to me is, is that some people pointed this out is that this just seems to be more javascript hubris and i totally agree with this there is a lot of people in the javascript and typescript development community that seem to think javascript and typescript is this magic language because of how it's, it's been freed from the shackles of classes and traditional object-oriented programming that all these new um, things can be solved. All these new problems are going to be solved. Classes and strong typing are not the barriers to innovation that people think. Um, and the reason I point this out is, is that these JavaScript is not this massive new thing. We had Lisp. We had Scheme. People knew about this. People knew that it existed. This flexibility has always been there right? It just for the longest time was might be maybe not necessarily performant enough to get things done. But the thing about it is, is that even now we might have a little bit more leverage in terms of overall performance. This flexibility doesn't make this automatically, automatically happen either. Um, strong typing does not prevent you from doing this stuff, nor does it magically solve all the issues in this area. And so I have some big question marks about this. And certainly it's one of those things where not only that, but basically it's um, you're you're asking to be locked in to a specific vendor at this point if you're doing this, right? Because you're completely at the at the whims of the person that describes how use workflow and use step are compiled. So from that step alone, I think people you would be right in arguing about why are you doing it this way versus something where you might have a chance of porting it to something else or maybe even open sourcing it at some point. And again, um, what really bothers me is that there's, there's too many people that think JavaScript is a, is a magic language, um, when it's not. Um, it has a lot of issues, it has a lot of problems. And I think, unfortunately, there's too many developers that have kind of been addicted to this false sense of flexibility where um, they can do anything because they can be really clever. Um, and it's just not the case. Um, I, for one, I think they kind of don't understand how other languages have really come along in terms of supporting that kind of flexibility. And two, again, ignorant of the history from the fact that this was what languages were like for quite some time. And I'm not sure that the barometer swung so far back over that is going to take over again um, in terms of, oh, well, we're all going to be writing things in, in uh, TypeScript. I'm just basically, it just doesn't seem to happen because the creaks and the cracks are already showing everywhere. And so, again, um, from a language perspective, it's one of those things where it kind of baffles me and um, how this is a kind of like worse is better round two. Um, for those of you who are not aware, there was a whole talk about um, Richard Gabriel, which was a person from the Lisp community. Well, I see and C++ ultimately took over from Lisp in terms of dominance, even though Lisp was the more right thing to do. And basically what it was is, is that um, Lisp was a li just a little bit too elegant. Um, and I think JavaScript and TypeScript are also just a bit too clever. And so they really are more worse is worse. It's just that we have so much software that's using it that we just haven't been able to move past it at this point. And the only thing that makes this interesting outside of just some argument over, you know, language semantics and, you know, basically aesthetics, to be perfectly honest, is, is that a lot of this code and a lot of these solutions just isn't that great. You know, there's not this big, awesome boom in usability and good experiences from the user side, I see, in applications. And so it's, it's an excellent question to ask of maybe we should start doing something different so we can actually start develop, um, providing better software um, to uh, users. Anyway, if you've liked this video and got this far, please do uh, leave a like or a comment, subscribe to my channel, do all the YouTube things that lets YouTube know we exist. I'm trying to up my subscriber list, it helps. And so again, thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.